All right, welcome on inside yet another edition of the Business of Social podcast powered by STN Digital. Just so people don't think that we record this top, because I always say the same thing each and every podcast. I'm giving this a little, you know, little different, different feel. But uh, it's a Business of Social podcast. Every single show will, producer will, we talk to the experts and get their take on the ever-changing digital social marketing landscape. This show is no different. Episode 62, Will Kelly. I know we made a change here last episode to stop talking about little known linebackers back in the 40s and get into celebrities that are this this uh, number, 62. And I heard, as you were prepping for the show, Will, a lot of fire at 62. So I'm excited to hear this list. And let me clarify, no disrespect to the linebackers. We're just mixing it up a little bit yeah, until we get yeah. back to the skill positions. I'm fine. I'll disrespect the linebackers. <laughs> uh, all right. I'm going to rifle through these real quick. Okay. Alec Baldwin. Giancarlo Esposito, <laughs> I don't know why Jamie Lee Curtis, Gary Oldman, Tim Burton, Michelle Pfeiffer, hmm? Vigo Mortensen, my boy Andrea Bocelli, <laughs> Kevin Bacon, uh, Rick, <laughs> Lucky Ali, Mark Cuban, Andy Reid, Andy McDowell, Sharon Stone, Clancy Brown, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Annette Benning, Tim Robbins, Shawshank Redemption, Drew Carey. And Drew Carey. One more. Chris Collinsworth. Hmm. If you memorized all those, kudos to you. This is the Bocelli podcast here. On, <laughs> this is a social podcast. We're excited to uh, to get into it. Um, I almost went Neil DeGr- What is it? Neil deGrasse and Tyson? Neil deGrasse Tyson, yeah. Because um, I want to get I want to get into like Instagram hacking and some data nerd stuff. So we could have went that route, but um, anyway, so we are talking to one of my good friends in the industry, Katie Daly. She just recently got promoted, congrats to her, to the vice president of social at ESPN. I always joke around with her. She's been promoted every year for the last 10 years, uh, but all good for women empowerment and just love love her, uh, I guess, her rise to stardom over there at the at the Four Letter Network. Um, so we're really excited to dig in. Uh, we talked to her, Will, what, about, I'd say a year and a half ago now. Sounds about right. Um and I know that we had a great conversation. I, I felt like I wanted to talk to her for another hour. So we promised like we got to do a part two. So we have we had Blake Lawrence part two. And this is Katie Daly part two. So I think there's a two, the two back to backs that we are starting to kind of like recycle some amazing guests on the show and get even deeper into social, what's changed, everything like that. So you guys are really going to enjoy this. Katie Daly, she's a gem, VP of social at ESPN. All right, I'm so excited. She is, of course, uh, the newly minted VP of social over at ESPN. Katie Daly joins me. Katie, what's going on? Hey, thanks for having me on. I'm so excited. I know we talked like, I don't know, on the podcast like a year and a half or two years ago. I don't know how long it was. And we, we said at that time, we need a part two because we were like going all the way to the bitter end and I'm excited to get into it. I like to kick things off usually with a random question. What's your favorite meme? Like your go-to gift that you're oh. dropping in text? I mean, there's so many, right? There's... That I took that personally. There's the the Rodman directions. There's the Bernie meme of, yeah. of late. I mean, I do like love. That. Well, so I'm from Vermont, so all the Bernie memes <laughs> love so them. Good. Yeah, uh, I feel like I'll use the dog in engulfed in flames room <laughs> decent amount, which is another classic. Yeah, that's um, like every is, everybody in social fine. media should use that for sure. Right, I yeah. think that's that was a pretty token social media response uh, yes. that this is fine. So I'll go with that. Um, I joke around with you a lot. I think when I texted you um, when you got the VP position, like I did it, Joe. You know the the famous uh, <laughs> account, uh, um, you know uh, meme there. But you know you've had a great, I think, really impressive and inspiring career at ESPN. I mean, I think you've been here almost a decade now. Yeah, over a decade. Uh, wild because when I when I started we had separate mobile and desktop teams and I was on the mobile team sending push alerts uh so to just to look at where we are and even from a social team when I joined social there were just a handful of us with the entire company thinking about the space and now we have an entire team and department so it's exciting yeah, I think you've been promoted like nine times or something like that in nine years. So <laughs> no big deal. Uh, but, yes, that's your recollection. No, yes. I'm, <laughs> no, I'm very, I'm, I'm very grateful that the company believes believes in me, but also just believes in the space. Right? I kind of, I got lucky in that the thing I was very, very passionate about yeah. happened to also be the thing that was 
skyrocketing. Yes. Um, so yeah, it was some good timing and, and a lot of, I think pushing, I'm passionate about this next generation of sports fans and always have been mm-hmm. the casual, the more casual fan back in the, um, my digital days, I was writing for page two, page two doesn't exist anymore, yeah. but that's what that was about, right? Mm-hmm. That intersection of sports, pop culture. And now I think social is the manifestation of that in many ways. That's awesome. Yeah. Congrats on all the success. I want to go backwards because your story is interesting and we've all had our different take on COVID over the last 12 months. Part of me kind of wants to like not talk about it, but I also feel like it's such a important um, part in our history. And we're going to just go back to this for the rest of our lives, really, of how we pivoted, what were the silver linings, all those different things. But your story is interesting because like you literally gave birth to your first child, like April 1st, I think, which is right at the height of this thing. Like, all right, team, best of luck with this. I got to go like, you know, raise a human. Um, but like, talk me through like as, I mean, I think the the country kind of shut down like March 13th, if, if I, or at least Adam Daly, Adam Daly, um, Adam Silver, he shuts down the NBA, I think March 12th or 13th. So t- walk me through that. Like you get that news. So you see that on your, your Twitter timeline that Adam Silver is suspending the NBA indefinitely. Yeah, I think that, you know, I think to start, a lot of us were thinking, okay, this is this is serious. This is going to mean work from home for a little while. Mm-hmm. But I don't, I don't think we imagined no. that we would still like at least for me here in the uh, in the office, not yeah. in the ESPN office, right? Yeah. That it would be as long of a haul as it was. Um, our team in that moment. I, I think really stepped up in a huge way because there were so many groups at the company that looked to our team to go, okay, I need to, I want to connect with fans where they're spending time. And you have the ability to do that, not without being in a studio. So um, we sprung to action and, and partnered with our um, linear producers and, and others to really think through, okay, how are we continuing to, engage fans and there were shows like PTI around the horn, right? Like all these shows were scrambling to figure, to figure it out. And I just, I thought as a company, we were really resilient, but then as a social team, um, especially with me stepping out to raise human life, (laughs) um, the, the team, yeah, the team stepped up in a big way for sure. But what is it like internally and just like always going through your mind when like literally it's in the middle of the, uh, ba- you know, college basketball tournaments, we're heading into March Madness, the NBA suspended season, then it's just that cascading effect. And I mean, ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports, you guys literally, that's what you do is live sports. And now it's turned off. Like that just has never happened in your career at ESPN in general, probably in our lifetime. I, mean, I even remember back, I was looking at history back in World War One and Two. they were still doing Wimbledon. They were still doing these live events and now it just stopped. So um, at any point, was it just like, was it scary? Was it crazy? Like what was kind of your... Your mindset, or maybe you're just raising a kid. You couldn't really even go there, compartmentalize. <laughs> well, before so before I went out on parental yeah. leave, I think it was we almost didn't even have time to stop and process. Yeah. It was just one thing after another. We did um, all time greatest college hoops player execution. We started talking immediately to our Snapchat partners about a throwback series. So I think there was to use a sports term, there was pivoting happening all over the place, yeah. and it was the frequency was such that. I don't think I even had a moment to stop down and go, what is, you know, yeah. what are we doing? What are we doing three weeks, four weeks from now? It was just keeping our heads above water. What are we doing tomorrow? What are we doing tonight? Um, but yeah, I think, again, I think the team stepped up. And uh, I think the other thing about social that we had working in our favor is that we had always had this content discovery muscle, right, of, of UGC mm-hmm. and monitoring things that were coming from our fan base. And we were able to lean into that even more yep. during the pandemic. So the fact that as a team, we had 64% year over year growth in engagements. And as an industry, the percentage was like three, per, you know, yeah, not without just sports, live events, that's in, that's entirety. Yeah. Right. So that was and really like a testament to just being creative, thinking of on the state executions, 
Um, and again, kudos to the team because I, I wasn't there for all of it. Right. Um, but they just, they were creative. And I think that's where you want to build a team of people who are going to rally and, and think of ways to engage their fan base, even when the live sports go away. Well, I think I speak on behalf of all my friends, family, the entire STN employees. Thank you, ESPN, all your colleagues for the last dance. Because let me tell you, like from an emotional standpoint, like, and I'm not even joking around here, like <laughs> that was important. Like that was something to look forward to. That was the Sunday, like, and as you know, with COVID and quarantine, like everything, every day just kind of massed together and there was no beginning, no end, but that provided like escapism, nostalgia, and just entertainment when literally there was like not only not live sports, but no new programming, no new movies, no new things you can look forward to. I'm sure you got that feedback only internally, but also externally, but that was like, we'll look back at that too. Like the last dance, that was an important time for the yeah. country to just like escape. Yeah, the sentiment analysis on that was <laughs> yeah. was through the roof, right? Yeah. People yeah. were were really happy, <laughs> including me. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't exactly. getting a lot of sleep, but you know, to have to have something to watch when that I was, was... <laughs> with my daughter. What are the um, so? I think for us, and I think you and I may even talked about this. Like we went directly to. We need to provide escapism content. We need to provide entertainment. We need to provide nostalgia during those times, but. Any like silver linings or things that you guys were forced to pivot and the fact that ESPN was able to not only survive, but thrive with all live sports not there, it kind of provides almost like a basement or a foundation. Like we're always going to be okay. We got this, but any silver linings or any learnings you and your team took from kind of, we're kind of hopefully getting out of this thing, but in the dark days of quarantine and, and all that and no live events at all, stuff that you guys learned about yourself, your team, your strategy that you'll take, take forward. Yeah. So I think of it two ways. I think there was a lot of learning that happened within the team. So really the, even though we were remote, there were a lot more serious conversations, right? Like our country was grappling with things well beyond sports. And we had a lot of conversations, some of which I was able to join some of them. I, I was not, mm -hmm. but just, with people bearing their souls and, and talking about the importance of diversity and content creation, yep. but also in decision-making and, and the work that we needed to do there. So um, we actually had a speaker come in a few weeks ago and um, Alain Sylvain, and he owns an agency and he, he used the term brave space and creating for teams to create brave spaces instead of safe spaces. Ooh, I like that. And I really loved that because mm -hmm. I think for our team, that was, that was a huge 2020 learning and silver lining was sure. We're going to have uncomfortable conversations, but that's, what's going to make us better and, and lead to real progress. So I think through the lens of our team, it was a really, it was a hard but really important year. Um, and then I think from a, you know, from a content perspective, we had Omar Raja and his team yep. who had really, right, the, the House of Highlights brand on this, this idea of UGC and connecting one-to-one -one with the community. And so to have that and lean in um, to not only the Instagram DM one-to-one -one relationship with fans at a time when they really needed that, but, but also TikTok, right? Like last year at this time, we're talking three, 4 million followers. Um, we just hit 14 million the yep. other day. Yep, saw that. And I think a lot of people were turning to, to TikTok to fill that void of entertainment and um, for content surfacing, but also content engagement. And so, um, I think those are a couple of, of silver linings that come to mind. Yeah. There are more, um, but yeah. People forget like that, like highlights were, everybody kind of ran out of highlights. They ran out of nostalgic highlights and people were posting UGC of trick shots with ping pong balls and pots in people's living rooms, but it was still entertainment. It was still escapism. And like, that was like where we got to at a certain point where it's like, all right, like this is kind of a sport in a way. Let's, you know, let's reshare this. Yeah, for sure. We had, like sock sliding <laughs> competitions. <laughs> yeah. But then again, I think in, in TikTok as a platform, I think you've seen like evergreen content 
does exceedingly well. So our, our top tick of 2020 um, was someone in the military coming home and reuniting with her family at a Harlem Globetrotters event. Yep. And I don't know off the top of my head what year that was, but obviously that wasn't in 2020 mm-hmm. and over 60 million views there. So there was an, I think an appreciation, but especially on that platform an understanding that not everything is happening in real time, but we can still um, enjoy the content for what it is for when it happens. Yeah, and I think uh, I want to. I would love to dive into TikTok and just what you've seen and, and what works for you guys. I mean, probably one of the most successful brands that have, you know, especially, like you said, last year to grow 10 million followers, um, especially during you know when, when you can't really lean on the LeBron James dunks as much, uh, you know, as you would in the past. So, um, talk me through just like what you guys have found there, like what the team looks like, and I mean just how important that is. Cause I mean, Gen Z obviously lives, lives there. And I know ESPN consistently wants to go after a younger demo. Yeah. So I'll start with shouting out Omar Raja over a million followers now on TikTok. really, um, someone who recognized pretty early on that the, that the platform was skyrocketing. Mm-hmm. Um, Alicia Suji on our team, another just super smart, from content discovery, content creation, and there's, I could name a million more. Um, but we, so essentially what we did without having, you know, incremental resourcing, we just had people recognize the importance of the platform and start to lean into the, what I call like algorithm astrophysicists (laughs) and and really pay attention to, okay, we posted this, it did, X amount of views in this amount of time. And then we go back the next day. Okay. Where is it at now? And learning from that because any, any new platform, any algorithm, as you know, is, is different and it's going to be different for different brands, but we needed to figure out what is, what is it that people on that platform are looking for from, from the ESPN brand. And yes, we tried your more traditional, highlights and we still do here and there, right. but by and large, that's not what has been over indexing yep. right now. It yep. has been more, more of your UGC. Um, just the other day we posted like a slippery stairs championship video that now has over five, five million views. Wow. Um, yeah. Who knew this was a sport, but sort of your, your Ocho esque content. Um, and I guess what's, a, what's a video that lives rent free in your head, you know, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I yeah. think um, the other thing is we want to continue to be nimble because we know, and we saw this on Instagram as well, what might be working one week, one month isn't what's working the next month. So how are we thinking through, and we have Slack channels where we talk about all of this, right? Hey, I saw this video that was more narrative storytelling and we ha- we do that very well at ESPN. How are we thinking about uh, narration and storytelling on the TikTok platform. Um, Gary Streisky, another talent that's really taken to TikTok and and found his his groove. And he is on campus because he's taping shows on campus. So he's taking people on ESPN tours, and that has been really great for his account yeah. and his audience. When we we've ported a few things over to ESPN, some work, some don't. So right. again, just going back to that. Um, algorithm and continuing to test and learn. I was actually having a conversation with a colleague almost like a week or two ago, and it's funny how social has really changed. Even in the last like 12 to 18 months, I'm sure you'll agree. Now I feel like when people like you and I are building out teams, I almost need like a comedy writer now. I need someone that's good at coming up with memes and like coming up with tags and stickers and, and making sure that is a pop culture fit. And also, like you just said, the data analyst and the Instagram algorithm hacker, like those are becoming so important to strategy rather than, you know, three or four years ago is if you can make a really dope graphic with Steph Curry on fire, it's going to be your number one over indexing content. But now, I mean, it really is becoming like the same thing back in linear where you had the good, good TV writers and good videographer. I mean, it's just like it's become a much more complex. Yeah, I think there are companies that actually specialize in that now, right? And in, in sort of hiring out like, hey, do you want a comedy writer for your award show um, to yeah. help? And yeah, it's it's crazy because some of it is um, certainly some of it's the, the copywriting. We see mm-hmm. that with a number of brands. Some of it is that rich media, right? Making sure of 
authentic, but yeah. also premium. Like you don't want something that looks like someone did it in paint. Um, <laughs> and, and then the, yeah, I think the analytics piece is, is so critical. Um, I'll shout out Brendan Martin on our team who makes me smarter every day in, in crunching numbers and, and looking at the data. I just think it's, it's sort of a case study in why you need to invest in your social teams. Yep. Um, right. Just, okay. A few people to, to push content out the door. Like we, we've evolved beyond that. Um, and, and now we're really programming our own little networks, right? That, and, and that involves all sorts of different skill sets. It's almost like um, like in-house counsel, like lawyer, HR, compliance, like things change so much <laughs> that you have to make sure you invest in those departments because laws change, compliance change, minimum wage changes, and you can get really in trouble if you don't like really take that seriously. And now with social, like, like you said, the algorithm has changed so much. What worked yesterday doesn't necessarily work today that you really have to invest in like have enough people to look under the hood and not just, you know, uh, be posting uh, on a whim. Um, I want to get your thoughts, like going back to Omar for a second, as we know, came from, you know, House Highlights to Sports Center, and then does a lot of stuff on TikTok and, and a lot of stuff for you guys. But what are your thoughts on on brands and handles having a voice behind it, having a personality? And, and you look at ESPN, it's PTI with Will Bond and Kornheiser. It's Sports Center with Scott Van Pelt. It's actually worked to attach a name to a lot of linear programs. What do you think the future is, and what is your recommendation for brands when it comes to like, should there be a, you know, a leading voice when it comes to brands on social? Yeah, I do. I think it depends on what, what the audience already knows about your brand. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so my answer varies there, but we've talked about it a lot internally. We've talked about the, there's a huge upside to saying, right. Like here is, here's the person behind the account. If you have questions, feedback, you want to send them content, like it just, more personal. Mm -hmm. But if you do have an umbrella brand, that is a lot of different things to a lot of people. There's a challenge there. And I think, um, so I think if I were starting a brand net new in a, in a specific, let's say like a sport vertical or a specific fashion vertical. Yeah. I, I'm a pretty big believer that this next generation of fans is going to continue to want to connect on a more one-to-one level and a human level um, with brands. But if you already have a particular um, brand equity, right, with that audience, you may need to think differently and and approach that differently. Yeah, I I never really thought about this way until you articulated what you just said, but um, I think it also gets away from like, who's the social media intern on this account? Like, it's crazy that it's 2021 and that still is the first thing people say. Like, we still haven't got past that. But when you know it's Omar, people aren't saying like, oh, someone like screwed up or somebody posted something weird or why did he post that? It's like, they can actually say, no, like uh, Omar is behind this account. And I know he has a ton of help from your team too, but it does kind of get away from that weird thing. Like, oh, it must be an intern posting. Yeah, it's a it's a really, really unfortunate yep. um side effect of the industry still being relatively new this assumption that it's a bunch of non-professionals or people with that lack experience um and and in particular i mean one of the things about tiktok that i do like is that is the positivity yes in the comments like we tend to see less of that whereas if you look at something like the quote tweet function which I think a lot of people in the industry will call the dunk function. Yeah, It does lend itself to um, criticism and, and Twitter trolling. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we like to try to rise above that and have a conver- have it's, the conversation. It's because Twitter's internally. 80% male. It's you know, hard. Anytime there's too many males on a platform, it just gets... <laughs> it's uh, Women's History Month, so yeah. Yeah, exactly. Let's blame it. Let's blame it on the men. Um, no, you know what's <laughs> funny about TikTok as a user and as someone that, you know, posts for brands is... They just done a really intoxicating job of that algorithm working, you know, for somebody even like me too. Like you just like when you're in that app, you're either in it for 45 minutes or you're not in it at all. Like it just is crazy how you get sucked in. And I think to TikTok's credit, the algorithm is so good where I don't even know that I want to see this content, but it's showing me this content, whether it's like comedy or advice or motivation. And I don't even follow people in those different verticals, but yet it's still coming up based on time spent or based on 
you know, obviously me liking it. We know how algorithms work, but I will say like it's it's much more sophisticated I think I've ever seen from uh, any of the social platforms. Yeah, and I think that's a that's another reason. There are so many reasons to have a diverse team, but like yes on that too, right? <laughs> if whatever I'm seeing, like I'm seeing a lot of new mom content. Mm-hmm. Doesn't exactly land right. uh squarely in the in the ESPN zeitgeist. Yeah. Um so I I recommend like start an account and start liking college football content if that's what you're looking to right. cover. Um, because you're right, the algorithm is is great, but it also will remember whatever the first few actions you've you've taken on content are. I think you and I geek out over like data and evolving and adjusting. So I want to kind of get into Instagram a little bit. And like you said, I was looking you guys up on my um, my favorite platform, Crowd Tangle. Uh, but I was sports that are again during. A pandemic, you guys still grew 5 million followers, which is about 30% of your overall audience, which is incredible. Uh, the ESPN handle grew 3 million followers over that 12 month uh, period as well. But what have you guys found? Like, we, we've obviously found small hacks where you can, you know, obviously albums over index or the algorithm plays nicer with albums. So when you can, I, I've noticed a lot of sports accounts, they're posting the first highlight, but also an alternate angle to make sure it is an album. So it is kind of getting more gasoline on that fire. But I, I'm sure our audience would love like any fun things or surprising things that you've seen that tend to work well. And, and I know it could change tomorrow, but just some stuff like that, that you, uh, that you guys yeah. employ. Yeah. I mean, I, I can't give away all our secrets, but I do think that, um, you know, lately I think we're seeing really good success with reels. Same. Yep. And I don't want to, ignore stories because we just had our best story of all time. We did a Lakers heat, um, execution nice. and it, it incorporated a lot of polling, right? So that interactivity within stories, I think is, is pretty key. The real question is, are you guys monitoring tap backs as an official analytic number? I think it's important. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're listen, we're going to look at, we're yeah, going to look at everything. All data we're not points. doing, yeah, we're not doing, enough stories right now to um for there to be any excuse to not look at every angle yeah yeah. when when something does well or something does poorly um i think that's important too you mentioned crowd tangle like look at what's underperforming and Mm -hmm. and why is that and um at the same time we have i think healthy conversations about how are we expanding our audience so if we know that a LeBron highlight is going to do well because it's LeBron. Um, what are we doing to serve the WNBA fan? How are we involved in in that conversation and, and in audience expansion? And so as much as follower growth and engagement, they are important. That is, you know, those are the KPIs that yeah. we're looking at, specifically engagement. I would say we're, we're actually, we don't spend a tremendous amount of time like counting every single follower as much as we're looking at on a post level yes. basis, what what's over indexing engagement, what's what's under indexing. But yeah, I mean, I think we still have a responsibility to make sure um, whether it's through your core brand or in, in our case, we have the luxury of having a lot of great sub brands. Our ESPNW Instagram account is like a hockey stick mm. right now. Crazy, crazy engagement and growth. And um Shout out to Hannah Witt in there and Keith Trawick and others. Trawick, oh, I knew I was going to get his last name wrong. <laughs> um, we just talked about that the other day. But yeah, I think that I think it's really to your point. It's studying the algorithm. It's funny you say albums because we say carousels, but same thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then and then continuing to to look at what's not working and what's working. I think we talked about on the last show, like, you know, obviously the worldwide leader of sports, Disney umbrella, like ESPN tends to have like an unnecessary target on its back. But when it comes to like the own and operator, like at ESPN, how do you, whether it's internally or externally, um, you know, people are always going to say, like you said, like you need more female content on this handle, or you need to be speaking more to baseball content, or you're posting Mm -hmm. LeBron stuff too much or Steph Curry stuff too much. Like, when that, when the, there's always gonna be somebody that's unhappy, I guess my point, at your guys' level, when it is like literally the worldwide leader. So how do you um, deal with those conversations? How do you kind of make sure that you are being true to different verticals, but at the same time, like you have to do what's best for your audience? Just curious how you've, how you've uh, done that in the past. Yeah, we, we get together weekly 
Um, so it's, it's the team that posts across over 20 brands, three different platforms. And we are, I think, very generous in how many slides we try to fit in an hour, but we basically have different groups come in and present. Um, I'll give you an example. Our, we have ACC and SEC network mm-hmm. um, accounts. And as of late, gymnastics content is over indexing like crazy for those audiences. So that's shared in the team meeting. We talk about it, we celebrate it. And then we look at, okay, what's, what's an event coming up and how do we make sure that an ESPN mm. is amplifying cross posting, maybe original posting with a via, right? So there's a, there's definitely, I think a team culture to having having those sub brands understanding what's over indexing there what does that mean for the multi-sport brands and how we're engaging those um you know i i did like a just again because i'm a data geek but i looked at like it's a few months ago so the numbers could be a little bit different but i think it was like bleacher sports center barstool house of highlights and on average that that group of you guys posted like about 27 times a day organically on Instagram and about 60% of that content was, you know, the UGC and, and the feels like you always talk about, um, which makes it so much more important. Like if that's 60% or what have you, that the 40% of original content allows you to differentiate yourself from the other people that may be doing similar things. So when you guys look at your original content and like, I guess that mix of, we want to entertain our fan base. We want to make sure that we're an aggregator and making sure we put smiles on people's faces, but also um, here's what we want to do on the original side that you can't get anywhere else except on the ESPN platform. Yeah. um, I think, listen, we're, we're so fortunate to work at a company where we have talented content creators in every corner, right? We have, um podcasts with incredible guests we have first take and the ability to take talent like Stephen a yeah right and his perspective on something and optimize that for social and get that out for fans um we have a storytelling team that does these cover story executions once a month that are really like a deeper look and highlight a particular athlete. Um, so we have that opportunity and we have investigative. Yeah. Um, the Jared Port, the Jared Porter story, you know, was, was huge and mm-hmm. huge shockwaves across the sports world. And that was our investigative team. So it almost feels unfair right? <laughs> because we do have, we do have a lot to, um, we have a content fire hose to choose from. And so our challenge becomes more, I think the, the optimization of that and and making sure, right. That we have the bandwidth to spend time with the other teams and figure out, okay, if this is a five minute feature for linear, how are we going to make that cut through um, in social or within the ESPN app, we program the stories section of the app and, um, that's been a really great tool for making some of our longer form premium content more digestible and then allowing people if they want to, they can, you know, that's a good point. I mean, for you guys, you have no shortage of original content with all of your different departments and linear and ESPN plus. So it's really a matter of like, how do we slow down this fire hose and see what is going to be, you know, like there's just so much. Um, did that, does that ever scare you? Like if we're going to miss something, like if Michael Jordan called in for five minutes to one of your, ESPN radio shows and like, what if like we just totally miss it? And like, guys, like, how are we not on this right now? And everybody else is, or do you just say like, hey, it's gonna happen once in a while. We'll we'll get it when we get there. Yeah, I think all the time. Yeah. I think it's just it's we we try to wrap our arms around around it, but we can't we can't actually watch every single show and every moment. So we right. we trust we trust the community, our community of colleagues to flag things for us, Mm -hmm. email, Slack, you know, we make our alias widely available. Um, and, and occasionally we may see something take off on Reddit or, you know, a smaller fan and have, and that's our alert to it. Right. 
um, candidly, but mm-hmm. I'm at least grateful. Okay. We know that this great thing happened and and how do we move on from there and, and amplify? Talk me through the logistics of running 20 brands. Maybe you can just like spout off a couple of them that we may forget, but like, sure. I'm just, yeah, I don't, I don't know how you guys do it. Like, I think you probably need 200 people to do that and, and, and how many people you actually have doing that. But Walk me through, I guess, some of the brands that people like may forget that you guys oversee and um, just logistically how you, because you guys are 24-7, 365. Like there's no, there's no time probably yeah. where you're off. <laughs> yeah. So ESPN and Sports Center are the biggest and, and most well-known. Um, I've mentioned ACC, SEC, ESPNW, ESPN FC, MMA. I mean, we could go on and on um, with the, with sport brands and we actually, I was just thinking in looking at our job descriptions earlier this week, we have the the phrase thrive in a team environment yeah. and unquenchable thirst for learning. So I think those two things are really key because we, we ask a lot of our social specialists um, truly in a given shift, like you could be posting to 10 plus wow. different brands. I don't think we ever get to, to 21. Um, in a given shift, that might be. Someone we'll go for like a yeah, PR, a world, world record. Happens. You should just you should yeah. do it one day. Um, so, so the team. I mean, first of all, I think it's the social specialists on the team are so good at what they do, um, and they really rise to meet the challenge every day. Um, and then, secondly, I think we have to be pretty ruthless with our prioritization. Right, we have to be realistic that we maybe are not going to have the absolute greatest NBA specific Instagram account in the world, because we might Mm -hmm. have that content living in sports center or on ESPN, or by the way, we might notice that actually our NBA and ESPN Facebook page is where we're getting a ton of global traction. And we really want to focus on that community. So we do have to make those decisions on a platform and brand basis to say, Hey, let's shift our, we have to shift our focus a little bit here and there. And then we're going to, we'll tweak that over time. So with the rise of TikTok, right, we had to make some decisions about how to reallocate our, our time to make sure we were focusing on TikTok. Um, audio social is one that has come up recently and we are starting to think about, all right, what do we need to do less of in order to meet the rising demands yeah. of our audience? It's some, uh, I know when I, you and I met at Bristol, we ran into Matthew Barry. I could see him on Clubhouse, you know, giving some fantasy advice maybe on a Sunday morning, things like that. Yeah, what are your thoughts? I mean, yeah. Clubhouse, Twitter moved pretty quickly, almost immediately with Spaces, um, you know, and we've seen different audio platforms over the last decade or so try to rise up, but it seems like Clubhouse has found, again, you talk about the algorithm, you know, I'm, you know, seeing anywhere from Elon Musk obviously was a big deal, but people talking about, um, diversity issues, people talking about how to run a business, how to start a business, how to grow your marketing. There's so many different levers there, but what are your, it seems like you're pretty, pretty excited about the audio. Space. Yeah. I mean, well, speaking of levers, I think for them, the algorithm is like their notifications, right? Like that's their, that's their primary yeah. lever and, and the thing that's blowing up my phone uh, multiple times a day. But yeah, I mean, I think still, if we look at the the broader landscape of social, still relatively small, like yep. 10 million weekly users is reported. Um, but I think what excites me about it for, um, I I think I'm excited for creators, like a different type of creator to emerge because the conversations are largely driven by subject matter experts. And we certainly have a lot of those at ESPN. Um, but you're not, you're not reliant on, um, the physical, you're not real on the visual, mm-hmm. right? I, I like this idea that it's a lot more um, connectivity with your audience. It's it's really like a depth, to me, it's a depth strategy. We <laughs> about, especially lately, about a width strategy, which is like reaching the broadest possible yeah. audience or a depth strategy, which is maybe you're not reaching 
as many people, but as you're reaching them, it's a really, it's a really deep connection. I love how you said that because I think that's something that you probably struggle with. I struggle with like, guys, sure, we can be on nine different platforms and do it at 20% or let's focus on three and do it at 110%. I'm sure that's a conversation you always have across every yes. time a new platform, you know, a new show pops up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but I'm, ex I'm excited about Twitter spaces too. I mean, I think we all as sports fans we understand that twitter is is a great co-viewing companion yep. and so to be able to go a little bit deeper and and you know have a twitter space as something is going on as a, as a live sports event is taking place i think is great and then you know as a since we're on a podcast right yeah. now like yeah. the expectation of quality volume which hopefully producer will is finding that my, my volume is great but like <laughs> none of that when you're when you're jumping on clubhouse um you don't have those considerations and so i think that barrier to entry right is just is just lower and the the issue with that is then eventually you do need to have the platform has to figure out well how am i surfacing the truly um valuable maybe valuable is not the right word but like quality conversations um and how are we moderating out the conversations that really shouldn't be on any platform yeah fun fact uh will has a terrible twitter username it's like will jr3478 <laughs> or something so i said go get at producer will and somebody already got producer will so i gotta hit up our boy no. tj <laughs> tj or david herman and say hey is there any way we can we can get that and get that for Purdue? um so i wanted to talk about the um Okay, here's one random. The, well, you mentioned kind of the, I guess the expectation of quality is not really there. And I think um, not so much on your world on the linear side, but I've really been super strong on this. It's like, I think we've unopened something interesting with COVID. And that's like, oh my goodness, like Scott Van Pelt can uh, broadcast Sports Center out of his bedroom. Like, oh my goodness, like when you look at, around the horn, they kind of always done that, but they were like in, you know, really high quality studios, but they can just put a zoom. And, and now all these, all this talent has different lighting. You've seen play by play broadcasters for the NBA. Yeah. They're not on site anymore. So are you excited, I guess, about that's kind of been opened up from every executive at every TV network that, wow, we actually can produce some shows that may not have to cost millions of dollars because now the audience is like, Hey, like, I don't want to watch it all the time, but I can watch a, you know, 30 minute show. That's not necessarily a 4k camera. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think that we were early believers in that, you know, working in social, mm -hmm. we saw that talent turning around their phone and doing a selfie video and sending that out was over indexing. Yes compared to like this polished mm -hmm. studio video. So yeah, it feels like, it feels like others are <laughs> sort of like yeah. catching up to I what we it. already knew, mm -hmm. which was, yeah, that that authenticity, which I know the word is overused, but I do think the authenticity levels have just risen um, in the past year. And I think it's, it's a good thing for people in social content. I keep on saying that because of, 2020, like really digital, I think is fast forwarded five years into the future where even from the brand standpoint, Fortune 500 brands, I'll give you a fun story. Like there were some brands that just used to ghost me and now all of a sudden like, David, can you hop in a call with our CEO tomorrow? Like, you know, because, oh my God, like we may not make it if we don't take this seriously. I know you and I have been screaming for 15 years on this, uh, on this mountaintop, but, um, as we go forward, now that it's like so essential, I think, you know, we, we probably would have got here eventually in a few years, but I feel like the time is now where I'm sure you've seen it internally. I'm sure you've seen it with your externally as well that, um, I mean, if you're not, if you're not on this thing and you're not looking at it and you're not hacking it and doing all those different things that you're going to be left behind. Yeah. It's critical. Like I'm a biased party. I, I realize that, but it is critical. Like, invest in what you're doing off platform. Yeah. If you're listening and, and on the fence, like invest in it, but the trends are not going to miraculously reverse. Yeah. I think, yes, you want to stay nimble, right? The audio conversation is a good example of that. Um, but in general, if you have a group of people who are used to high volume, they're used to serving, younger audiences, mm. they understand the different types of content that work 
on different off-platform spaces, like all of that is only going to benefit you. Um, so yeah, I, that continues to happen. <laughs> You're like, I agree. Um, <laughs> we haven't talked about this yet, but NBA top shot, like this is a, this blow your mind. Like what's happening, like on the crypto highlight front, like, I think a highlight went for $400,000 recently. Um, but it's almost like I, I kind of caveat towards uh, the Pokemon of NBA highlights in a sense. Um, but any initial thoughts on what the hell is happening in that world? Yeah. I mean, first of all, it's a huge basketball card collector. Yeah, um, me too. You know, I have like the very thick yep. <laughs> booklet of all of my cards. I got a Still. chest of my parents' attic that has all the, you know, the uh, yeah. Kobe rookie cards and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, does it surprise me? Yes. Like, did it, did it take me some time just to look into it and <laughs> understand it? Wait, yes. Right. I yeah. think that, um, but I don't, I don't know. I, I feel like, I guess I'm not, I'm not one of those people that's going to talk it down. Um, I did make a beanie baby joke because I still have a bunch of beanie babies. <laughs> I used to do beanie babies so too. Like, we were the same person growing up. This is funny. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I, yeah. I, I, so I did make a beanie baby. I had a John Elway beanie baby in a like glass case that I kept the back. Yeah, so don't. Yeah. That was my that was my um, ask to not don't come after me on Twitter because yeah. I made a beanie baby joke. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's interesting. I think the there's a lot of potential. Like without going too deep into um, the IP piece of it and what that could mean for um, companies yeah. like the one I work for, mm -hmm. I think I think it's interesting. It's a space to watch. I'm not personally running and um engaging but that doesn't mean i i don't appreciate the, the let me level. let me know if you could just give me like a just a heads up if espn ever goes to like the crypto highlight format because i want to buy the stephen a smith uh, kwame brown um rant that would be my i'd pay good money for that at least ten thousand dollars i think he, um, yeah i mean <laughs> he would be he would definitely be like the the jordan of um yeah yeah <laughs> Right. We're talking Kwame Brown. Who cares? <laughs> All right. Um, I asked you this like a year and a half ago, so I'm wondering if any of this stuff has changed. So rapid fire, um, we'll get you out of here in a few minutes. Um, what's the one social or marketing tool that you could not live without? If Slack counts, Slack mm. <laughs> right now. How many rooms um, are you in? That's a good, that's a better question. Too many. <laughs> Yeah, I, I just glanced over at my notifications and yeah, an hour, an hour now. not looking at it all of a sudden. Yeah, it's, uh, I now have, have anxiety. Dig yourself out of that hole. Um, <laughs> I think I know the answer to this based on what we've been talking about the last hour. But from a business perspective, what social platforms seem to be working the best for you all right now? <laughs> from a business, listen, we we have a um, meaningful business overall on social. I won't yeah. get into like by platform, mm -hmm. but. Um, so I think from a business perspective, very excited and lots of growth. That's my <laughs> corporate answer. Yep. Um, from it, from an audience perspective, I think as it relates to youth, I'm I'm super excited about TikTok. Yeah. Um, but I think I said this last time. I love all I love all of our partners <laughs> for different reasons <laughs> and have good relationships with them all. So. <laughs> of course. Um, yeah. You mentioned too one of your. Um, famous highlights from the last show was don't give in the FOMO. Don't look at your profile and, and assume that your followers are like, you know, ESPN hasn't posted in a few hours. I wonder what's going on over there. A lot of brands freak out about that. And I will admit a lot of clients are like, why haven't we posted? You know, it's like, guys, like there's no need to get crazy here. Um, so that was a good thing that we took take away from that. But any other tidbits like that or anything that you've learned over the last couple of years that whether it's like, just your go-to answer, whether it's like, let's calm down, let's re Aaron Rodgers, relax. <laughs> um, anything like that that you can give the uh, listeners? <laughs> well, I do think, yeah, I mean, I'm still a, I'm still a big believer in, in quality over quantity. Mm -hmm. I think um, it's so much better to be right than be first. Yeah. Um, and I say that as, you know, we're a brand that people look to, to fact check. So we hold that responsibility when, even if we're second or third to put something out, um, 
we do need to just make sure it's right. So we've been preaching. Um, I think there is this urgency, right? For there's a hunger for engagement. Yeah. And, and I love that. I love that about um, everyone who works in social, but what we've seen is that is if you put that hunger above thoughtfulness, right? The downsides, right, far outweigh could be catastrophic. Whatever yeah. upside, yeah. whatever upside you were you were going to achieve from an engagement mm-hmm. perspective. I love that. Um, anything that you read uh, or recommend any social media marketer to read on a daily basis, follow on a daily basis, newsletters, anything like that. Yeah. Um, shout out Kendall Baker, former ESPNer, Axios Sports. Love his stuff. Yeah. Um, I think front office sports is yeah. is great. Um, I do the hashtag sports newsletter. I like newsletters. You know, I don't like new mo- new mom. Not a ton of time. <laughs> um, <laughs> Can so, you condense this for me and make it really easy? <laughs> yeah, and then I. I also, I love going to Google news. This is very nerdy. I love going to Google news and just typing in Me too. or NBA top shot and just reading yeah. different publications and their takes and different authors to try to get that, um, diversity of perspective. Yeah. Um, I, this is actually an important one. I just, just thought of this, any, like, I guess life hacks, someone in your position, VP of social, um, there's always a reason to check in. There's always a reason to ideate. Like, have you found any like life facts in terms of boundaries that you've set, notifications you've turned off, blocks on your calendar to make sure that you can focus on big vision stuff, like anything like that? Because I think that's something we all struggle with in this industry because you think you're going to miss out if you're not constantly tied to your device. Yeah, I should have mentioned that's another another silver lining for our team this past year is we've talked a lot more openly about mental health mm. um, and mental wellness. And so in those conversations, we actually formed a committee um, on that. And I just got an invite for a, a meditation session next week. Um, and doom, am, doom scrolling I'm, is a real thing. Yeah, I'm personally, ter- I, I will admit, and my team knows this, um, I'm pretty terrible at, at finding the balance. But mm-hmm. what I did when I was out on leave that I, you know, I got feedback that people really appreciated it. I wrote a little about me letter because we had a number of new teammates and I didn't get the chance to do sit down meetings yeah. with them in the office like I would have. And in my letter, it, I put an entire section about like how I communicate, how I communicate and my expectations. Mm-hmm. And I very clearly stated, I may, I may email you because I'm up with my daughter at midnight or one. I don't expect you to respond. Mm -hmm. If you're not working, do not reply to me in that moment. Do not feel like you need to. I'm telling you right now, you don't. I'm just telling you for me, I may like my mom brain may forget whatever it was that I was going to send if I don't hit send on that Slack. So I'm going to, I'm going to hit send. And I think just, I don't know. I just think the more transparent we can be about how we all prefer to operate yeah. and what our personal boundaries are like knowing that I have a caretaker that comes at nine. So at, you know, having a meeting at nine is going to be difficult because yeah, handing, handing off the baby. Right. So like, yeah, I just think the more transparent we can be about how we, how we like to work and communicate. It's the funny better. you said for whatever reason, my, like my, I reach um, flow state at like one in the morning, unfortunately. So, uh, but what I uh, what I started doing, and I'm like you, like if I don't email this now, I'm gonna forget about it. So I have to get this out of my brain. Um, I started scheduling emails. Like I have like an app on my Gmail that it can go. So like people will get like 19 emails from me right at eight in the morning <laughs> because I've just scheduled them like at one in the morning. But that's, yeah, I agree. Cause I, I've always felt bad, like, God, they're going to be on their nightstand hearing a ding and it's their boss, you know, like it's all bad. So that's a good, uh, that's some good advice there. Um, And then what inspires you just to stay cutting edge and like continue to evolve and not get beat up too bad or get too uh, defeated, uh, the kind of the the daily grind? Yeah, I think um, this is maybe a mushy and typical answer for a new parent, but I do think that having my daughter gave me a lot of perspective on what, what really mattered in life. And that, um, prior, like, I just think the fires that happened before she was a part of my life seem like the flames seem a little smaller Yeah. when I think about her and the responsibility of, of raising her to be, um, just a good human being. And so, 
that's that's been that's been a huge life and perspective shift that's helped but i'm also very very innately competitive like mm-hmm. just have always been <laughs> i can't play like board games without getting a little too intense so a part of it so just if you is start a podcast you're gonna stop coming on, coming on mine is that what you're saying <laughs> maybe <laughs> <All right. laughs> no i'm not right. i'm gonna start a club i'm gonna start a clubhouse room oh, okay gotcha we, we can go ahead and head on that. i'm kidding that's funny um yeah it's funny my, my senior vice president had a child during quarantine a lot of my best friends for whatever reason did uh obviously you like wait till we tell these quarantine babies what the hell we went through in 2020 it's gonna be it's gonna be a fun fireside chat for sure yeah absolutely <laughs> um well listen katie i uh i appreciate your your friendship and uh, colleagueship if that's a word and coming on the show providing all the value um and congratulations on all your success you're uh, you're killing it gonna write a book one thank day thank you thank you no i appreciate you you having me on and, and the great conversation all right well th- we'll record this on a friday so have an amazing weekend and enjoy the rest of your day yeah. we'll talk soon you too all thank right. you bye bye All right, there she was, Katie Daly, the VP of Social at ESPN. Thank her so much for taking the time out of her busy schedule to chat with us here on The Business Social. If you did not get value out of that show, I don't know what you're doing with your life. So uh, that's that's you. That sounds like a you problem. Um, how about producer Will get a little shout out there from Katie Daly mid-show? That was nice to all your work be enshrined in uh, royalty. She's uh, one of the founding members of the Producer Will fan club. I mean, <laughs> couldn't, couldn't be nicer. Maybe she could have, I'm telling her, me and Katie will get to the bottom of this Twitter thing. We'll get at producer Will at some point. It's, uh, what, what I say? I said your, your Twitter handle. It looks like producer Will has been inactive since 2014. So we may have a, your, a your tw- what I say, your Twitter handle just, just stinks. It just, okay. <laughs> I want to set the record straight real quick. It's not that confusing. It's just the, with an extra E will Kelly. It's not like W WJ three is Riggins, by the way. Oh, the other way. <laughs> Wow. I stand corrected. So look, I don't love my handle. But I it's stand not corrected. <laughs> that one, that one's not good. We didn't get, we didn't get the at Riggins if that's available. Then okay, that's our creative director. If you guys don't know, and I just mixed up the two wills, which is not not a good look by me. It's a common right. occurrence. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, there's so much that we can dig into here, but I love how she called it like the data astrophysicist or what have you. Like God, these algorithms change so often, and you know, the the difference from po- just posting a highlight or posting a highlight with a second angle and making that a carousel on Instagram could be the difference from 2,000 views or you know 1.2 million views just by playing nice with the algorithm and understanding what data is doing. If you're not looking at your data, you're doing it wrong. And I love what she said too. Do we wanna go width or depth? I love that. I never really articulated that well, but I, I've told clients this so for so long that like, let's go on Clubhouse. Like guys, 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 you haven't even figured out Instagram yet. Like I know Clubhouse is fun, exciting and sexy, but you're only posting, you know, three times a, a week on Instagram. Like you gotta figure out your Instagram strategy, your Instagram story strategy, your Twitter strategy, your Facebook, all these different things before you get too, like you said, we're going too wide here. We need to get more depth. So that's, um, some great advice uh, as well. And I think like her and I talked about, you know, social is now becoming so intrinsic that you need a comedy writer. You need a data person. You need somebody that understands nostalgia and sports and humor and pop culture to really be able to connect with your audience in a meaningful and like she said, like everybody says, in an authentic way. So amazing show. I'll probably listen to that one, Will, a couple times over because she dropped so many gems. Uh, one of my favorite people, Katie Daly, thank you so much for coming on the show. As always, we'd like to thank uh, Dave Furk. How about Justine coming in? Got to thank her for the help in the setup. Will Kelly, are you uh, planning on going somewhere? I mean, what, what, what's going on here? I'm just making sure all our bases are covered here. <laughs> God forbid, Will, producer Will wants to go on vacation, right? All right. Uh, Will, Furk, or Justine, thanks for all your help on the show. This has been another edition of the Business of Social podcast. My name is David Brickley, and it's been powered by STN Digital.